All right, well, we are at three minutes past the hour. So I think that means it's a good point to, to start. Um, and hopefully there'll be some more people joining later. But hello, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to you all, depending on which corner of the world you're joining us here, um, joining us from today. Um, welcome to the launch of the webinar, um, launch webinar, sorry, of the report Capturing Economic Opportunities from Wind Power in Developing Economies, a report brought to you by in collaboration with BVG Associates. So for those I have not yet had the pleasure to cross paths with, my name is Reshmi Ladwa, Policy Officer here at the Global Wind Energy Council, and for this year serving in an extended role as our COP28 Programme Director. So in today's webinar, we celebrate both the release of this report, which was officially launched yesterday um, in English and is due to be launched both in Spanish and Arabic too. So please do watch this space for, for those um, versions of the report. Um, and also just to pull out some key findings from the report as well. And to do that, um, I am joined here today by our very own Emerson Clark, Market Development Director at the Global Wind Energy Council. From the BVG team, we have Mike Blanche, Associate Director, and George Hodg Hodgkinson, Senior Consultant at BVG Associates. I'm then also delighted to be joined as well by some of our market-specific experts, and I guess I forgot to mention which markets we're covering. So this report covers um, the economic opportunities in five key markets, including Argentina, Indonesia, Egypt, Morocco, and Colombia. Um, and so those experts come from those regions and have an extreme wealth of knowledge in those regions. And those experts include um, Omar Nagy, the head of wind energy from Infinity Power. Um, so welcome, Omar. Deka Purchase, director and chief operating officer at UPC Renewables Indonesia. And last but not least, Najla Yazgi, Manager, di Managing Director for Morocco at Siemens Gamesa Renewable Energy. So thank you. And before we start off with any presentations or any discussion, I would like to take this moment to thank all of the companies alongside BVG for all of the work that has gone into this report, including all the data contributions by our lovely companies. So thank you very much. Um, but on that note, I'd like to hand over to Mike from the BVG team for a few remarks on the report, um, followed by George, who will give us a high level overview of the report before we jump into the panel discussion with our super knowledgeable panel. So on that note, I will hand over to you, Mike, to start. Thank you. Apologies, Mike, you're on mute. <laughs> thank you. First glorious mistake. Uh, thank you very much, Resmi, uh, and very, uh, very warm welcome to this seminar. I hope it uh, gives you a, a good summary uh, of of the report and uh, the findings that uh, that uh, uh, the report presents. We found generally that there are quite uh, similar barriers in all countries. I mean, it includes um, countries that are uh, uh, anywhere in the world, not just emerging economies, of just getting things things right to enable wind to be built out and, and avoiding mistakes from uh, that have been seen in other countries. So our key thing here was to make sure that uh, that uh, yeah that uh, mistakes or um, delays or whatever that have been seen elsewhere, there are ways of, of tackling them and dealing with them and overcoming them. So I think it's first my first message is to be confident that there are things that can be changed for the better. And, and the benefits that arise from that we talk about a period of five years in the report quite a lot, but a lot of that is setting things in train that enable uh, good practices to continue. So you see great benefit in 2027, but you see even better benefit in 2028, which is beyond, beyond the, the uh, time period that we looked at. Um, and the benefits are large in terms of CO2 reduction, in terms of pollution reduction, uh, in terms of job uh, opportunities, particularly sustainable jobs, long-term jobs that are going to go on to, into the future. And even there's benefit in water reduction. Water is, is a particular key, um, key thing that we're very keen that we see reductions in the use of it. Or, um, and, and strangely enough, we talk very much about wind energy, but actually there's a water reduction as well impact. The other thing to say is we think it's very important to see collaboration with industry. Industry is there to deliver things, and that's what we want to see happen. Uh, so there's some short-term things that can be done immediately, and there's also things in terms of longer-term, putting together frameworks and things like that, making processes clear, and uh, making 
regulation, transparent, all things that uh, can make a really major difference. So that's uh, my concluding, uh, sorry, well, sorry, initial re remarks. Uh, I'd like to now uh, hand over to George, who's going to go through a bit more of the detail of the report. Over to you, George. Thank you very much, Mike, and thank you all for coming and your interest in the report. Um, are we able to share the slides? Great, thank you. Um, so next slide, please. Um, thank you. So um, wind energy plays a vital role in supporting the clean energy transition globally. Um, to limit the temperature increase by the end of the century to one and a half degrees Celsius, the volume of annual wind installations must quadruple over the next decade. Um, the urgency for moving away from fossil fuels and trans transitioning to clean energy generation is well recognized by countries around the world and was a clear, key element in the Glasgow Climate Pact endorsed at COP26 in 2021 and reaffirmed in Egypt as well at COP27 last year. Um, the need for increased energy security was also, was also drawn into unfortunate um, focus last year with the Russian invasion of Ukraine highlighting how important domestic energy supply is to many countries and the costly consequences of not having a significant domestic energy supply. Um, despite of this, however, there is a growing mismatch between the ambitions and targets around renewable energy and net zero and then the actual market realities. Um, so installing wind energy capacity needed will require a shared vision and collaboration between government, industry and society. It is vital that wind energy does not face unnecessary delays due to resolvable challenges such as overly complex permitting procedures and market barriers to investments. Uh, next slide please. So in this report we looked at the economic and environmental benefits that could be created from wind energy up to 2027 in five countries. So we have Argentina and, Argentina and Colombia in um, South America, um, Egypt and Morocco in, in Northern Africa and then Indonesia in Southeast Asia as well. So these countries were chosen because they have significant and still largely untapped um, wind energy resource. And in terms of energy security, they're a mix of net importers and exporters as well. Um, because, the net, because the report only looks at the next five years, all the capacity included is just onshore energy, uh, wind energy, but these countries also have significant offshore wind potential as well. And many of the broader recommendations in the report are definitely relevant to offshore wind, which is, which is worth highlighting. Next slide, please. Um, to be started off with a business as usual forecast for installed wind energy capacity in each of the five countries. So we looked at their current wind energy situation, including ambitious um, ambitions and targets, um, commitments made at COP conferences, economic stimulus and laws relating to clean energy since 2020 as well. So working with uh, local wind energy associations and private companies such as turbine suppliers, um, in each of the countries, we identified the specific potential barriers to wind energy and provided recommendations on how to overcome those barriers as well. Next slide, please. So once we identified the barriers and actions that policymakers could take to overcome them, we then created a wind acceleration scenario um, of installed capacity, which showed how much wind energy could be installed in each of the five countries if these barriers were overcome. So across the five countries, this amounts to 12.4 gigawatts in total um, over the five years, which is an increase of 42% compared to the business as usual. This increase is especially evident in 2026 and 2027, as you can see on the right there. Um, and then, as Mike said earlier, this trend definitely continues from 2027 onwards as well. Next slide, please. So we then modeled a range of economic and environmental impacts from the, each of the scenarios, such as things like full time uh, job years created, gross value added to the economies, uh, tons of CO2 saved, as well as um, uh, water, amount of water saved and, and the amount of homes that could be powered by clean energy as well compared to fossil fuel generation. So the table is in the report, so I won't go through it in too much detail, but just to pull out a few of the findings. Um, so an additional 64,000 jobs could be created in Argentina. Um, compared to, uh, Colombia could uh, um, avoid an, uh, an additional 103 million tons of CO2 equivalent emissions. Egypt could add an additional 2.1 billion US dollars of GVA to its economy. Indonesia could power 200,000 additional homes. 
and Morocco could save 3.7 million additional litres of water as well. Next slide, please. Um, so finally, we identified three potential main barriers to wind energy deployment, which are common across developing economies, um, economies around the world, and then provided recommendations to policymakers on how to address these barriers proactively in cooperation with the wind energy industry and other stakeholders as well. So the first barrier we identified was around policy commitment. So in many countries, governments remain committed to conventional fossil fuel based electricity, um, even in countries where the government is generally positive towards renewable energy, such as Colombia, and have clean energy targets in place. There's often a lack of um, enabling policy and regulation to support investment in wind energy. So to overcome this barrier, um, policy must provide a clear vision of the government's long term plans to provide confidence in the market. So this could be through national targets, updated um, NDCs, comprehensive um, climate strategies and energy plans as well. National vision should include specific wind energy targets with clear timelines and roadmaps to achieve it, achieve it as well. Uh, the targets and strategy for wind energy and associated grid should be aligned between public bodies um, such as climate, environment, energy, the economy and infrastructure as well. Uh, the government needs to clean, uh, clearly state their aspirations for facilitating wind energy deployment to help the industry deliver, and especially around things like supply chain development and cost reduction. Um, because the development and construction of a wind energy pro project can take longer than the typical political cycle, uh, cycle another key thing is uh, cross-party uh, cross support. It's really important because it helps provide confidence to investors that uh, the, commi the commitment will continue um, beyond the political cycle. Um, a clear route to market is also needed to decrease in investment risk for developers, as well as to aid investment in the local supply chain. And a long term procurement pipeline should be established with clear visibility of the areas suitable for deployment. Um, and finally, as Mike touched on earlier as well, collaboration between industry and government is key um, to successfully building and also evolving the required policy frameworks. Next slide. So the uh, second barrier we identified is around the transmission system infrastructure. So as wind energy projects rely on a mix of land availability, wind resource and grid connection points, the areas that are best suited for wind energy projects are not always the same as where the grid is well developed. And for island nations like Indonesia, this barrier is sort of extra apparent as well. Um, the development of the transmission system infrastructure in many countries is coordinated by separate organization to, what, to that which plans wind energy projects. So in some countries, the grid is also managed by uh, regionally instead of nationally as well, which is a, an additional barrier. So if this leads to the transmission system not being developed at the right time and in the right place, then this could increase investment risk and potentially delay wind energy deployment. So to overcome these barriers, there are a number of actions that policymakers can take. So introducing a clear bankable and fair mechanism for allocating grid connections is important for developers as a lack of this can increase investment risk. Large scale public and private investment in secure, smart and flexible grid is key as well um, as more energy renewable, uh, renewable energy rather is connected to the grid. Uh, forward planning of network expansion um, and investment in developing the network should be accelerated as this can help avoid delays and grid congestion and increase the potential sites developers will um, look at for wind energy projects as well. And this grid, grid planning again should be done in coordination with the planning for future wind energy sites as well to ensure that the grid is available when needed in relevant areas. Next slide, please. So the third overarching main barrier we identified is around complex frameworks for leasing, permitting and power purchase. So in many countries, these frameworks are very complex and bureaucratic, which can lead to a delay in wind energy deployment if projects can't obtain the necessary permits and approvals in a sensible time frame. So documents and um, applications are often need to be submitted to multiple national and local agencies, and a lack of clarity on, and, uh, on procedures and timelines, as well as poor coordination between these agencies and jurisdictions can lead to delays, uncertainty and inefficiencies. So to overcome these barriers, first thing is frameworks must be simplified. So government could, um, should consider establishing a one-stop shop to manage and coordinate all the documentation and applications needed for wind energy deployment. Uh, strong coordination between the different framework administrators is key as well as coordination with the ministries, uh, as well as, sorry, coordination with the ministries responsible for the energy and environment. 
uh, developing and changing legislation and frameworks can take time as well. So it's important that governments facilitate good communication with the industry to plan and implement any changes within an agreed timescale. And some framework measures that should be considered are things like mandating maximum lead times and per, to permit win projects, um, a structured and time limited process for developers to provide evidence for their expected timeframes and project plans, and as well as a, a clearinghouse mechanism for any legal dis disputes that arise as well. Next slide, please. So to summarize, we looked at the environmental um, and economic benefits that wind energy could provide and found that in the five countries examined, compared to a business as usual scenario, uh, wind acceleration could add an additional 3.6 gigawatts of um, wind energy, create 468,000 full-time equivalent job years, add 7.8 billion US dollars more to the economies, and save over 243 million tons more of CO2 equivalent emissions. So to achieve this, um, we found three common barriers to, um, for policymakers to overcome and accelerated uh, wind energy deployment requires clear policy commitment from government, sufficient transmission uh, system infrastructure, and simplified frameworks for permitting, leasing, and power purchase frameworks. By addressing these barriers, we identified proactively policymakers in developing economies can increase energy security and support an accelerated wind energy deployment. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, George. Thank you very much, Mike, as well, for those remarks and for the overview of the report. Um, for those of you that haven't had the chance to read it yet, hopefully that will give you a significant head start. Um, but without further ado, I'm keen to, to dive straight into the panel session and speak to the experts themselves. I'm sure they have loads to share with us. Um, so just before we do, just a few remarks. I mean, we mentioned long-term jobs, water reduction and environmental benefits as well, as well as the many other benefits that, of course, wind, wind energy um, can bring to local areas and to localities. And so one of the questions I wanted to open up to, to the panel, and I wanted to start off with Najli in, in particular to start with, to, to give the Moroccan perspective on how wind pro projects have created local value to wind abundant regions from, from your corner of the world, I guess. So this could be socioeconomic benefits um, or benefits that you've seen play out in real life through projects that Siemens have done in particular. So over to you, Najli. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, GWAC. Uh, thank you, uh, BVG, for allowing Siemens Gamesa to contribute to such uh, powerful reports. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. I hope so. Okay, super. Uh, we, Siemens Gamesa, are proud to play a role in the generation of the much needed electricity in Africa in general and in Morocco in particular. Uh, and to contribute to the country's uh, ambitious targets of reaching 52% of renewable energy in the energy mix by 2030. So as a leading uh, player in Morocco, since 2006, uh, we have installed and are maintaining over 1.3 gigawatts of uh, wind project installed capacity. And what is really uh, rewarding is to see how the wind industry is making a positive impact for the local communities. So uh, the major uh, socioeconomic benefit is the employment and training of workforce from the local community. As an example, the project uh, Middelt, uh, we have employed uh, new, uh, new employees of about 500 people, and which of them 250 came from the local communities. Together with our partners, uh, we focused uh, on uh, putting all the efforts uh, of hiring specifically the local workforce and to train them in specific areas so that so that this trained people would have then a, a sustainable job even after the completion of the project so uh, by the way the site of Midelt in Morocco it has been tagged by NL Green Power our partner as their most sustainable site in the world with 0% of consumption of drinking water by using collected rainwater and a complete autonomy uh, of electrical power. And that was by using renewable energy for all the lighting and the site facilities. 
uh, also when projects have contributed to the creation of a local value chain. So from the development of local suppliers, such as logistics, sites installations, uh, and also using materials locally, such as steel for towers, and the manufacturing of some of the turbines components locally. Uh, in addition, such projects contributed to the enforcement of local infrastructures like roads, uh, bridges, ports. Uh, another benefit uh, I would like to mention is the electrification of remote areas in Morocco, where long electric lines and substations were built uh, to connect the wind park. Those same uh, installations and infrastructures have also served to connect adjacent cities and towns to the national grid because they were disconnected completely from the national grid and that avoided to use the uh, diesel generation as the main source of electricity in some cases. Um, other benefits I would like to mention is the uh, contribution uh, of the uh, enforcement of the local infrastructure. Uh, I mentioned uh, roads, bridges, and, uh, and as well electric uh, lines throughout the, the, the country. And uh, of course, not to forget the social projects that each of our partners uh, are putting in place uh, in association with the wind projects in specific areas uh, to benefit the local communities. For instance, in uh, several of our projects, we have helped building sanitary systems for uh, remote schools, uh, planned thousands of trees near our projects and contributed to the uh, improvement of healthcare facilities. And in some cases, for instance, in the tough um, uh, times of COVID, we also have worked with the uh, organizations to uh, donate uh, food to, uh, to, to some families in need in the regions. That's great. I so mean, that is a little bit of a flavor of the uh, of the social impact that uh, that we see that the wind parks are, are contributing to to the countries in Africa and specifically in Morocco. Thank you, Najee. I mean, there's so many points that so many I mean benefits that you've that you've just mentioned there, and so many great points. But I think one that I picked up on in particular was not just pushing the idea that wind energy projects create jobs but also that there's sustainable job growth as well I think that's extremely important in the growth of our sector so thank you for that and now moving over to Deka I wanted to get your perspective from Indonesia obviously Indonesia has just one wind farm project at the moment that's that's live but um, it'd be really great to hear your thoughts on this too yeah absolutely so once again to to uh, all of you organizations on this call most grateful for the opportunity uh, you are right there's uh, there's only two wind farms in uh, in indonesia at the oh, moment yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and we are one of them uh, there's a siemens gamesa uh, turbine behind me on the on the on the screen um, so we're, we're proud to be able to have brought in some uh, pretty advanced technology into the into the uh, into Indonesia but it's a fledgling industry to say the very least I was thinking about an analogy earlier and it's it's not it's not even a sapling yet it's a couple of seeds it's a couple of projects that have been developed and uh, delivered and in fairness quite successfully so yeah as as uh, you know we have a similar list of activities that have that have been undertaken our location is very very rural um, so of course even drilling for water for clean water has been a, a very important part of of what we've delivered roads as well I mean it sounds remarkable but to start with basically wouldn't go anywhere near where our location is without a four-wheel drive and now you quite happily drive along in your family car to uh, to access all of the the surrounding areas and of course all of our local neighbors and uh, and stakeholders farmers in particular take great great advantage from moving their cattle around and, and growing their corn and growing their rice and so on and so forth and of course, we have all the, the, the additional items such as powering up the school and making sure that people have street lights. And, uh, and we're very proud of the fact that we've started off with a tourism centre. 
Uh, we've had an awful lot of interest in our uh, new modern technology, if you if you call it that. Um, and as a consequence, we've seen a lot of lot of people visiting the, the project area. And now uh, we've decided to, to create a sort of centralized hub for that. But the, the issue of jobs is is very important. Um, we're, we're proud to have a remarkably low turnover in, in our team. Um, and that's because there's a great deal of kudos that comes with having your GWO certification and all of the various certificates that that really mean that you're stepping out into a future activity. Uh, it's a 100 percent national team. So we've we, we, we picked the best and nurtured them through the system. Um, and the guys, are, guys and girls are, are doing a, a remarkably good job, very high efficiency. And they're very proud of what they do um, and they're very proud of what they've achieved and um, so as the report uh, touches on we very much look forward to much much more than just uh, a couple of seeds a couple of seeds you know we'd, we'd like to at least create a, a nursery of opportunity uh, and as the report quite rightly highlights we may well be the smallest uh, player in the in the global town of the report um, but we have opportunity and I think the report highlights quite correctly, uh, very prophetically, uh, exactly what the, the issues are that need to be uh, resolved to try and get uh, more momentum. And certainly let's try and achieve much more than 70 to 100 megawatts per annum, because of course the, the resource allows for that, uh, but the processes are perhaps stymieing it a bit at the moment. Thank you, Dacre. And I think it's impressive, even in small markets like in Indonesia, that we can still um, feel the benefits to the development of local infrastructure as well. I think this is this is definitely undervalued um, and is something that is definitely felt by communities, especially where, where projects are being rolled out. So thank you. Thank you for your insight on that. Now over to Omar. It'd be really good to hear. I mean, Egypt has has grown significantly. Um, quicker than the likes of Indonesia, for example. But it's really great to, it would be really great to hear um, your perspective on this too. Thank you, Rashmi, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, yes, uh, in Egypt, we have an installed capacity of around uh, 1.7 uh, gigawatt. And as per GWEC forecast, we expect to have a yearly installment of 250 to 700 megawatt per year. And of course, uh, this provides a boost to the national and also local uh, economic uh, activities. I mean, there is a significant uh, capital injection in the local value chain, and that uh, creates jobs for the local communities during the construction, uh, during uh, the development as well, and also during uh, the operation. I mean, uh, Egypt has a strong construction uh, industry. So of course, uh, during the construction of the wind farm, we have a lot of VOP contractors, several electrical involved in the process. And regarding the turbine, for example, we have a strong uh, local manufacturing. So for the turbines, the towers are uh, locally produced uh, in Egypt. And when during the construction of the wind farm, because most of the wind farms are mainly in desert areas, so you have the, also the native communities uh, like the Bedouin uh, benefiting from that. For example, uh, in the desert, the best security you can get is when you make deals with the Bedouins because they control the desert. So we also the Bedouins uh, get involved. Uh, a good example is uh, the West Bakr uh, wind farm that was uh, the last one commissioned in Egypt by, uh, and it was built by Siemens uh, Gamesa. And uh, this project created opportunities for the local employment and boosted social economic activities in the Ras Gharib area, which is the remote area. And uh, during construction, uh, more than 500 people were employed, of which around 25% were from this uh, local region. So in Egypt, the wind industry uh, has social economic benefits, not only on the national level, but also on the local area. So uh, the benefits are huge, yeah. I absolutely agree. And I think the West Backer Wing Farm as well is, seems to be the star of Egypt. It's it's done really well in terms of the value it's created um, to, to the region. Um, and also as well, the point I liked the point you made on the development of jobs along the value chain. I think that's that's important to show as well. It's not just engineers we need, there's a whole wealth of, of opportunities for people to move from, from other routes of work into, into the wind energy sector. So so thank you for highlighting that, Omar. 
I would now like to hand over to Emerson to get his perspective on both um, Argentina and Colombia as our LATAM expert for today. So over to you, Emerson. Thanks, y'all. I'll be speaking in my capacity as part of UX LATAM team here. And I, and I think that, you know, Argentina and Colombia, if we look at them as markets, you know, as why they were selected for this report, um, I think they have both opportunities and challenges that are actually quite distinct. And I'll start with Argentina. Um, Argentina is interesting because despite there being a, you know, quite a torrid history of inflation and macroeconomic difficulties, there actually is technically a proof of concept in very recent history. The Renovar program, which was launched in 2015, essentially allowed for the private to come in, bankable projects with, with government guarantees. This led to the deployment of just over six gigawatts, mobilized around 7 billion USD. And, you know, this was seen as a project that was actually, you know, looking to be sort of templated and, and actually serve as inspiration for auction systems going forward. Now, unfortunately, the Renovar um, program has fizzled a little bit. And this is why I think that it's really worth highlighting the potential that we see in Argentina. I mean, it goes without saying that it's actually that's one of the strongest wind corridors or in terms of wind resource, uh, it's not even an issue. And that's onshore and, and, and offshore. But um, I think it, basically we've had a change in government. It was the Macri government that, that brought in the Renovar program, the currently the Fernandez government, which you know is, a, is, is less supportive. And also the macroeconomic um, challenges have actually increased. I mean, we're talking about an investment environment that is difficult across the private sector entirely, but making it very difficult for foreign entities to, to invest in, in Argentina. But at the peak of the Renovar program, we saw local supply chain being developed. There were, there, there were jobs, infrastructure was being built. Essentially, all of those key indicators have actually already happened. We've just seen the, um, the volumes drop and the long-term policy visibility actually kind of go away. So um, Argentina is a model where like it, with the right confluence of, I think, you know, probably international macroeconomic support, whether that's via IMF or the World Bank through some sort of a debt for climate friendly investments type of program that we actually have spoken to the Argentinian um, government in the past about the opportunities that might be there, maybe in the form of some sort of just energy transition partnership, the potential is very much there to kickstart this again and actually see the accelerated, you know, the accelerated wind scenario um, translate into reality because we have seen that work very, very well. Unfortunately, you know, we need the Renovar program has um, lowered its cap to 10 megawatts and below to sort of a distributed energy type of model. Um, so large scale wind is essentially not happening in, at the moment in Argentina. And the auction pipelines are really sort of, you know, don't have as much visibility as we need a, a, as an industry to grow. But um, the upside in terms of jobs that George mentioned in, as a highlight on that table that he mentioned, we're talking about 64,000 FTEs over the lifetime of the wind farms that we see, you know, in the um, in that accelerated wind scenario. I mean, that's entirely possible. And Argentina has proven that they've been able to do it in the past. So once again, it's about this cross-party support. It's... Um, and they and um and I think you know coordinated effort between grid planning and and getting the the renovar and getting the conditions that allowed for renovar for a couple of years to be actually quite a bright spot and bring in that kind of investment. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll I'll pause there in Argentina and then maybe shift to Colombia, which is I think very different than the macroeconomic challenges that Argentina is facing. Um, actually, Colombia has got a new government. Uh, a little bit of a populist left government from, from Gustavo Petro, but interestingly, um, quite pro-energy transition, actually has already sent the right signals around phasing out the fossil fuel industry by limiting, I think, uh, by, um, by um, advancing the deadline for oil and gas exploration licenses. So, uh, however, there is, I'd say, um, overarching all that, there is a very strong just transition element to Colombia and the way they want to plan out their energy transition. So once again, the accelerated wind scenario is, you know, has about like one extra gigawatt of wind power over uh, between now and 2027. Um, that's quite a lot, given that our, uh, Columbia's first wind farms are st still really in development. And there's actually quite a big pipeline ready to be uh, constructed, but there are issues on the, on the permitting and licensing side that are being slowly but surely dealt with from uh, something that GEOIC is involved in with the local association and working with the government there. And that this comes back to this just transition element. 
which actually the job figures that the report shows can really play a key role in the advocacy that we plan on, on, on basing a lot, of, a lot of our dialogue with government with, because it's a lot of local communities in a very windy area called La Guajira, and the, that, that community engagement process is just a bit of a lack of streamlining there, and I think that as an industry, we still haven't properly shown what we can bring in terms of value. And I think that the, what's shown in this report um, in terms of jobs, we're talking about an upside of 148,000 FTEs over the lifetime of the wind farms. And that's a very powerful message to the local communities who will not only benefit from the clean power, the infrastructure that's going to be built, but also the jobs, as is the case in Ras Garab, I know that Omar just mentioned, and including really something that's relevant across the markets um, here. So, uh, so Colombia, I would just summarize by saying that the, the just transition and some of those actual policy barriers in terms of the permitting are really what's holding back the accelerated wind scenario, which is also really within the realm of reality alongside Argentina. So different challenges, but the accelerated wind scenario is totally within reach. Um, and I think the report's gonna give us some tools to deliver those messages to government. Thank you, Emerson, for providing the, the LATAM perspective and also the point you made on um, the political environment. I think this is particularly important for regions like LATAM where that can can influence um, project visibility and, and project rollout, I guess, in, in a sense. Um, and so just in the interest of time, I'm aware we're within the last six minutes. So what I wanted to do is we're not going to be able to get through all of the questions that I wanted to ask. Um, my panel of experts, but I would like to do, to finish off with a quick fire round, um, asking each of our panelists, and I'll I'll shout to you all out individually, um, on what one of the biggest challenges are in your specific market or country of expertise. So I'm aware Mark Mike didn't get a chance to to answer that last um question. So maybe we could start with you, Mark, um, and maybe you could give just your sort of top um biggest challenge um, that you foresee. Apologies, Mike, you're on mute again. <laughs> I think it is that the each country will have a, a, a different thing that's that's the most severe restriction. And I think it is that there are routes to getting over to overcoming it. People have overcome these sort of things, and there are different, maybe different in each different country as to as to what's necessary to do, but there are routes to uh, successfully overcoming a major, major shortcomings. So I think that's that's the key thing I'll say. There are there, there's plenty of ways of, uh, of uh, improving situations. I think just keep it simple as that actually, Rashmi. Great, that's perfect, Mike, thank you. And then Emerson, back to you, if we could have the LATAM perspective again. Um, look, the report is all about economic opportunities. And while the climate benefits are really, you know, are, are very valuable, I mean, I think that, you know, in terms of job creation and and the and the other benefits that come along with you know impacting local communities in a, in a positive way um i think are really the key to to all of this and um it really speaks to you know a mode of economic growth and development in, in a sustainable way and uh and i think that we pit that against the what the fossil fuel industry has done you know in, in either argentina and colombia um it doesn't you know the track record is not necessarily there we have a real opportunity here to to lead on an economic front whereas the climate i would just say is a very welcome bonus element in both those countries great thank you emerson naturally um i'm aware you were you were spoke right at the beginning and so i'd like to bring you back in now um with your your perspective on this Yes, I mean, of course, Morocco has abundant resources of, of energy, both in wind and solar. And uh, regardless of that, there are a, a few challenges uh, that could be classified both uh, international or global challenges as well as national challenges. So maybe I will start with one of the main challenges uh, that has been mentioned uh, before is the uh, saturation of the national grid. Uh, which requires reinforcements and entails uh, large investments uh, that now uh, must be borne by the specific project. Uh, and that increases the project development costs and, and therefore the uh, LCOE, the levelized uh, cost of electricity for the project. Uh, another uh, limitation, like it was mentioned also for most of the countries, is the laws and their test texts of applications that are taking too long uh, to be released 
such as, uh, I mean, there is a specific law, the 1309, uh, which has been expected to open to the medium voltage console, uh, consumers for, for a while, and it's taking a lot of time, the auto production law, which now is, is seeing uh, some progress, and also the, the grid code for the country. And, uh, and even when those laws are coming out, it takes a lot of time to, uh, to clarify the, their application. And also that uh, sometimes there is low visibility and unpredictability of large-scale projects. Uh, all of this uh, puts large uncertainties on the project's timelines and the scope of the project, and therefore it increases their development costs. Uh, there is also the global effect of the uh, COVID, the war in, uh, in Ukraine, which have resulted in uh, significant cost increases in raw materials and logistics, add to that the inflation, and all these increases uh, are not necessarily reflected in the tariffs for, for, for the wind projects, uh, which is making some of the uh, projects no, lo no longer uh, bankable. And, uh, and also delaying the development of, of new projects. Um, uh, another point uh, that, that also is putting uh, some limitations on the development is, uh, is the fact that the wind projects and the solar projects are not allowed to share the same connection points. Uh, and uh, these two types of renewable energy are supposed to be complementing each other. And in this case, they fall into uh, a little bit of uh, uh, competitivity, uh, competitivity for the land, uh, for the approvals to uh, to, uh, to to uh, interconnect uh, to the grids, uh, while they should be uh, complementing each other, as I said, to both mitigate the uh, the nature uh, of uh, renewable energies being uh, intermittent, and also to be able to uh, realize some synergies uh, to reduce. The, uh, the cost of the production of the projects by making it a hybrid project, maybe with connection with, uh, uh, with storage systems. So these are more or less some of the uh, challenges that we see here in the country. But uh, we hope, uh, I mean, uh, th th there is a lot of work that, that, that's been done uh, to overcome these challenges. And uh, I think everybody's in the same page that Morocco is uh, uh, with its great resources, has all the ingredients to uh, overcome these challenges and uh, realize uh, an accelerated transition of the energy. Thank you, Najay. So many, so many great points there. Um, but thank you, thank you for your contribution to that. Um, Dave, I believe this was one of the questions as well to you directly um, in the chat. So it'd be great to hear from you next on um, on Indonesia and the challenges. Yeah. There. Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. If, if I was to make one wish, I think it would be around the word integrity, that we have a plan. There is a plan for Indonesia, but currently it lacks integrity. There's too much contamination in the plan over projects that don't make sense, projects that are probably not going to happen. And it's, of course, contaminating the opportunity for those who do have real projects and do have the ability to deliver those projects. So we really need to, to call upon the stakeholders in Indonesia to say, right, guys, there, there has to be some consequence of a failure or a moribund situation. And if you can just get some checks and measures into your processes and reinvigorate those plans with with that integrity that i'm talking about then all the things will flow the procurement will flow the local supply chain the investment the attraction to indonesia the talk about success the low-lying fruit all of that will come from a well-constituted plan with good integrity Really great point. And there are really are so many moving parts to that. Um, and last but not least, um, Omar, over to you for the for the final final comments. Yeah, it's quite interesting in Egypt because Egypt has a long history with the wind energy, having uh, the wind uh, farms developed uh, in Egypt since uh, the 90s. And also Egypt has uh, very high wind speeds along the Red Sea coast, uh, 10 to 11 meters per second. So there is a huge uh, wind energy potential. And over the past two decades, there has been a significant cost reduction 
uh, in the uh, turbine costs and also technological advancement. So this has lowered the LCE over the past period. The challenge today is that the government is still expecting the tariffs to continue to go down. So what we are facing as uh, developers, because today there's a global supply chain, costs are going up, the interest rates are going up. So with the current prices and the expectations of the government to have lower uh, tariffs, uh, the project don't, don't, are not viable anymore. So uh, the only way forward is that the government should increase or at least maintain the level of the tariff of the past couple of years. Thank you. Great point to, to finish on, Omar. Um, the expectation that wind should keep getting cheaper is not, not the idea. I think that is an expectation that needs to be um, shattered in a sense. Um, there's no way we can sustain our industry if we keep getting cheaper. So a really great point to end on. I'm really glad that was that was what we get to um, close on today. And unfortunately, I would have loved to have kept this webinar on for much longer. But I think that draws us to the close of our launch for today. So thank you so much to all of our panelists for joining us. Thank you to the BVG team. And thank you to those of you at GWEC as well who have made this happen and also played an active role in um, in the launch of this report. So thank you. And I hope... Um, that you will enjoy reading it and I wish you all a very happy rest of your day um, wherever you are in the world and wherever you are joining us from. Um, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rishmi. Thanks all.